Chapter 2 Cain The salvation for my torments came from a completely unexpected source, and at the same time, something new came into my life that has had an impact to this day. A new student had recently entered our Latin school. He was the son of a wealthy widow who had moved to our town. He wore a black ribbon on his sleeve. He went to a higher class than I and was several years older, but I soon noticed him too like everyone else did. This odd student appeared to be much older than he looked, giving the impression of a boy to no one. Between us childish boys, he moved strange and ready like a man, more like a gentleman. He wasn't popular, he didn't take part much in the games we played, or much less in the fights. Only his self-confident and resolute tone towards the teachers pleased the others. His name was Max Demian. One day it happened, as it happened here and there in our school, that for some reason a second class was added to our very large classroom. It was Demian's class. We little ones had Bible stories. The older ones had to write an essay. While we were being drummed into the story of Cain and Abel, I looked a great deal at Demian, whose face fascinated me in a peculiar way, and saw this intelligent, bright, extremely firm face intently and intellectually bent over his work. He didn't look like a student doing a problem at all, but like a researcher pursuing his own problems. I really didn't like it. On the contrary, I hadn't anything against him. He was superior and cool to me. He was too provocatively sure of his nature, and his eyes had that grown-up look which children never love, a little sad with flashes of mockery in them. But I couldn't stop looking at him whether I loved him or hated him. But no sooner had he looked at me than I withdrew my eyes, startled. When I think about it today, how he looked back then as a student, I can say, he was different from everyone else in every respect had his own and personal stamp, and therefore attracted attention. But at the same time, he did everything possible not to attract attention, carried and behaved like a prince in disguise amongst peasant boys, making every effort to look like them. He walked behind me on the way home from school. When the others got lost, he passed me and said hello. Even this greeting, although he imitated our schoolboy tone, was so grown up and polite. Shall we go a little way together, he kindly asked. I was flattered and nodded. Then I described to him where I live. Ah, there, he said, smiling. I already know the house. There's just one thing above your door. It's a strange thing that's attached that's interested me right away. I didn't know at first what he meant, and was amazed that he seemed to know our house better than I did. There was probably a kind of coat of arms as a keystone over the arch of the gate, but over the course of time it had been flattened and often painted over, and as far as I knew, it had nothing to do with us or our family. I don't know anything about it, I said shyly. It's a bird or something. It must be very old. The house is said to have once belonged to the monastery. It could be, he nodded. Take a good look. Things like that are often very interesting. I believe it is a sparrow hawk. We walked on. I was very self-conscious. Suddenly, Demian laughed as if he had thought of something funny. Yes, I attended your lesson then. He said briskly, The story of Cain having the mark on his forehead, isn't it? Do you like it? No, I had seldom liked anything we had to learn, but I dared not say it. It was like an adult talking to me. I said I quite liked the story. Demian patted my shoulder. You don't have to fool me, dear. But the story is actually quite strange. I think it's a lot stranger than most of the other things that come up in class. The teacher didn't say much about it, just the usual things about God and sin and so on. But I think, he paused, smiled, and asked, But do you care? Yes, well, I think, he continued, there's another way of reading this story about Cain. Most of the things we are taught are certainly true and correct, but you can look at them all differently than the teachers do, and most of the time they make a much better sense. One cannot really be satisfied with this Cain, for example, and with the mark on his forehead, the way it is explained to us. Do you not think so? It's certainly possible for someone to kill his brother during a fight, and it's also possible for him to get scared and back down afterwards. But the fact that he was specially awarded a medal for his cowardice, and protecting him and fighting everyone else, is quite odd. Certainly, I said interestedly. The thing was beginning to fascinate me. But how else to explain the story? He slapped me on the shoulder. Very easy. What was there and with which the story began was the sign. There was a man with something on his face that frightened the others. They didn't dare touch him. He impressed them, he and his children. 
Maybe or certainly it wasn't really a mark on the forehead like a postmark. Life is seldom that rough. Rather, it was something almost imperceptibly sinister, a little more spirit and audacity than people were used to. This man had power. People dreaded this man. He had a mark. You could explain it however you wanted, and one always wants what is comfortable and right. One feared the children of Cain. They had a sign. So they didn't explain the mark for what it was, as an award, but as the opposite. They said the guys with this sign are scary, and they were. People with courage and character are always very scary to other people. It was very uncomfortable that there was a race of fearless and uncanny people running the world, and now they gave this race a nickname and a fable to take revenge on them, to make up for all the fear they'd endured a little. Do you understand? Yes, that means then Cain would not have been angry at all, and the whole story in the Bible is actually not true at all. Yes and no. Stories as old as this are always true, but they are not always recorded and explained in the way that is right. In short, I mean, Cain was a splendid fellow, and this story was pinned on him just because people were afraid of him. The story was just a rumor, the kind of thing people rumored about, and it was quite true in that Cain and his children really did wear some kind of mark and were different from most people. I was amazed. And then you think the manslaughter isn't true either, I asked, moved. Oh yes, sure that's true. The strong had slain the weak. Whether it was really his brother, one can doubt that. It doesn't matter, after all, all men are brothers. So a strong man killed a weak man. Maybe it was heroic, maybe not. In any case, the other weaker ones were now full of fear. They complained a lot, and if you ask them, why don't you just kill him too? Then they didn't say, because we're cowards, but they said, you can't. He has a sign. God drew him. That's how the dizziness must have come about. Well, I'll stop you. Farewell, then. He turned into Algas and then left me alone, more amazed than I had ever been. As soon as he left, everything he said seemed unbelievable. Cain a nobleman? Abel a coward? The mark of Cain an award? It was absurd. It was blasphemous and nefarious. Where was the good lord then? Hadn't he accepted Abel's sacrifice? Didn't he love Abel? No. Stupid stuff. And I suspected Demian was making fun of me and trying to trick me. Accursed he as a clever fellow, and he could talk, but like that, no. After all, I had never thought so much about any biblical story or any other story, and I hadn't forgotten Franz Cromer so completely for a long time, for hours, for a whole evening. I read the story again at home as it was in the Bible. It was short and clear, and it was crazy to look for some special secret interpretation. Every manslayer could declare himself God's darling. No, it was nonsense. The only nice thing was the way Demian could say such things, so easily and prettily, as if everything were self-evident, and with those eyes, too. Of course, there was something wrong with me. In fact, it was very disordered. I had lived in a bright and clean world. I, myself, had been a kind of able, and now I was so deeply rooted in the other, had fallen and sunk so much, and yet basically I couldn't do much about it. Now how was that? Yes, and now a memory flashed up in me that almost took my breath away for a moment. On that bad evening where my present misery started, that was my father then for a moment. I suddenly saw through and despised him and his bright world and wisdom. Yes, I myself, who was Cain and bore the mark, had imagined that this mark was not a disgrace. It was a distinction, and that through my wickedness and my misfortune, I stand higher than my father, higher than the good and the pious. It was not in this form of clear thought that I experienced the same thing at the time, but all of this was contained in it. It was just a flare-up of feelings, of strange stirrings that hurt and yet filled me with pride. When I think about it, how strangely Demian had spoken of the fearless and the cowardly, how strangely he had interpreted the sign on Cain's forehead, how strangely his eye, his remarkable adult eye, had shone at the same time, and it vaguely shot through my head. Isn't he himself, this Demian, a kind of Cain? Why is he defending him if he doesn't feel like him? Why does he have this power in his mind? Why does he speak so scornfully of the others, of the timid, who are really the pious and pleasing to God? I couldn't get to the end of these thoughts. A stone had fallen into the well, and the well was my young soul. 
and for a long, very long time, this matter of Cain, the killing and the mark, was where my attempts at discernment, doubt, and criticism all began. I noticed that the other students also dealt a lot with Demian. I hadn't told anyone about the Cain story, but it seemed to interest others too. At least there were many rumors circulating about the new guy. If only I knew them all, each one would throw a light on him. Each one would be interpretable. I only know that at first it was said that Demian's mother was very rich. It was also said that she never went to church, and neither did her son. They were Jews, someone wanted to know, but they could also be secret Mohammedans. Fairy tales were also told about Max Demian's physical strength. What was certain was that he was the strongest in his class. One who asked him to fight, and when he was refused, was called a coward and was terribly humiliated. Those that were there said that Demian only had to take his neck with one hand and squeezed him tightly. Then the boy had turned pale, and afterwards he had to creep away and was not able to use his arm for days. For one evening it was even said that he was dead. Everything was claimed for a while, everything believed, everything was exciting and wondrous. Then you had enough for a while. Not much later, however, new rumors arose among us students who reported that Demian had intimate dealings with girls and knew everything. In the meantime, my affair with Franz Cromer continued on its inevitable course. I couldn't get rid of him, because even if he left me alone for days, I was still bound to him. In my dreams, he lived like my shadow, and what he didn't do to me in reality, my imagination made him do in those dreams, in which I became his total slave. I lived in these dreams. I was always a strong dreamer, more than in reality. I lost strength and life to these shadows. Among other things, I often dreamed that Cromer abused me, that he spat at me and kneeled on me, and, what was worse, tempted me to commit serious crimes, rather not tempted, but simply compelled by his mighty influence. The most dreadful of these dreams, from which I awoke half insane, contained an attack, my father's murder. Cromer sharpened a knife and put it in my hand. We stood behind the trees of an avenue and watched for someone. I didn't know who. But when someone came along and Cromer, by squeezing my arm, told me he was the one I had to stab, it was my father, and then I woke up. In connection with these things, I still thought of Cain and Abel, but little more of Demian. Strangely enough, when he first approached me again, it was also in a dream. Namely, I dreamed again of the abuse and rape I suffered, but instead of Cromer, it was Demian kneeling on me this time, and that was quite new and made a deep impression on me. Everything I had suffered from Cromer in torment and reluctance, I suffered from Demian willingly and with a feeling that contained just as much joy as fear. I had that dream twice, then Cromer took his place again. What I experienced in these dreams and what happened in reality I can no longer separate exactly. In any case, my bad relationship with Cromer took its course, and it didn't end when I finally paid the boy the amount I owed for nothing but petty thefts. No, now he knew about these thefts because he kept asking me where the money came from, and I was more in his hands than ever. He often threatened to tell my father everything, and then my fear was scarcely greater than my deep regret that I hadn't done so myself in the first place. However miserable as I was, I didn't regret everything, at least not always and sometimes I thought I felt that everything had to be like this. A doom was upon me, and it was useless to try to break through it. Presumably, my parents suffered not a little from this condition. A strange spirit had come over me. I no longer fitted into our community, which had been so intimate, and for which I was so often overcome by a raging homesickness, as if for lost paradises. I was treated more like a sick person than like a villain, especially by my mother, but really I could see it best from the behavior of my two sisters. This behavior, which was very gentle and yet distressed me immensely, made it clear that I was a kind of possessed person whose condition was more to be lamented than to be blamed for, but in which evil had taken its seat. I felt that people were praying for me in a different way than usual, and I felt the futility of this praying. I often felt the burning longing for relief, the longing for a proper confession, and yet I also felt in advance that I would not be able to say and explain everything correctly to either father or mother. I knew that they would take it kindly, that they would spare me a great deal, even regret it, but not quite understand it, and the whole thing would be regarded as a kind of lapse when it was destiny. I know some will not believe that a child not yet eleven years old could feel like that, 
I will not tell them my business. I tell them to those who know the people better. The adult who has learned to transform part of his feelings into thoughts misses these thoughts in the child, and now thinks that the experiences are not there either. But I have rarely experienced and suffered so deeply in my life as I did then. It was a rainy day. My tormentor had ordered me to the Bergplatz. There I stood and waited, digging with my feet in the wet chestnut leaves that kept falling from the black dripping trees. I didn't have any money, but I had put aside two pieces of cake and carried them with me so that I could at least give Cromer something. I had been long used to standing in a corner somewhere and waiting for him, often for a very long time, and I accepted it the way people accept the unchangeable. Finally, Cromer came. He didn't stay long today. He punched me in the ribs a few times, laughed, took the cake from me, even offered me a damp cigarette which I didn't take, and was friendlier than usual. Yes, he said on his way out. Don't forget. Next time you could bring your sister, the elder one. What's her name, anyway? I didn't understand at all, nor did I answer. I just looked at him in surprise. Don't you get it? You should bring your sister with you. Yes, Cromer, but that's not possible. I'm not allowed to, and she wouldn't even come with me. I was prepared for this to be just another harassment and a pretext. He often did this asking for something impossible, frightening me, humiliating me, and then gradually allowing himself to be bargained with. I then had to buy my way out with some money or other gifts. This time he was very different. He hardly got angry at my refusal. Well, he said casually, you'll think about it. I want to get acquainted with your sister. It will work out. You just take her for a walk and I'll join you. I'll give you a whistle tomorrow and we'll talk about it again. When he was gone, something of the meaning of his desire suddenly dawned on me. I was still a child, but I knew from rumors that boys and girls, when they were a little older, could do some mysterious, offensive, and forbidden thing to each other. And so now I suddenly realized how outrageous it was. My decision to never do that was immediately clear. But what would happen next, and how Cromer would take revenge on me? I scarcely dared to think. A new torment began for me. It was not enough. I walked despondently across the empty square, hands in pockets. New torments, new slavery. Then a fresh deep voice called to me. I got scared and started running. Someone ran after me. A hand gently grabbed me from behind. It was Max Demian. I gave myself up. It's you, I said uncertainly. You scared me so much. He looked at me, and his gaze had never been more than that of an adult, never more superior and perspicacious than it has been now. We hadn't spoken to each other for a long time. I'm sorry about that, he said in his polite yet very definite manner. But listen, one needn't be so frightened. Well, that can happen. It seems so. But see, when you startle like that in front of someone who hasn't done anything to you, then that someone starts to think. It surprises him. It makes him curious. Someone thinks you're strangely jumpy after all, and then he goes on to think. That's what you're only like when you're afraid. Cowards are always afraid, but I don't think you're really a coward. Not true? Oh, of course, you're not a hero either. There are things you fear. There are also people you are afraid of. And you should never have that. No, one should never be afraid of people. You don't have any in front of me, or... Oh no, not at all. Exactly, you see. But there are people you are afraid of. I don't know. Leave me. What do you want from me? He kept pace with me. I had walked faster with thoughts of escape, and I felt his gaze from the side. Assume, he began, that I mean well by you. In any case, you don't need to be afraid of me. I'd like to do an experiment with you. It's fun, and you can learn something from it, which is very useful. Watch out. Well, sometimes I try an art called reading minds. There's no witchcraft involved, but if you don't know how it's done, it looks very peculiar. You can surprise people a lot with that. Well, let's try it. Well, I like you, or I'm interested in you. And now I'd like to find out what it's like inside you. I have already taken the first step towards this. I scared you, so you're skittish. So there are things and people that you are afraid of. Where can this come from? You don't need to be afraid of anyone. If you fear someone, it is because you have given that someone power over you. For example, one has done something bad and the other person knows it. Then he has power over you. You get it? It's clear, isn't it? I looked helplessly into his face. 
It was serious and clever as always, and also kind, but without any tenderness, it was rather severe. There was justice or something like that. I didn't know what happened to me. He stood before me like a magician. Do you understand? he asked again. I nodded. I couldn't say anything. I told you it looks weird reading minds, but it's very natural. I could also tell you pretty much exactly what you thought about me, for example, when I once told you the story of Cain and Abel. Well, that doesn't belong here. I also think it's possible that you once dreamed of me, but let's go on. You are a clever boy. Most are stupid. I like to chat every now and then with a clever boy I trust. You don't mind? Oh yes, I just don't understand. Let's stick to the funny experiment. So we have found, the boy S is easily frightened. He is afraid of someone. He probably has a secret with this other person that is very uncomfortable for him. Is that about right? As in a dream, I succumbed to his voice, his influence. I just nodded. Wasn't there a voice speaking that could only come from within me, who knew everything, who knew everything better more clearly than I myself? Demian hit me hard on the shoulder. So it's true, I could guess. Now just one more question. Do you know the name of the boy who was leaving earlier? I was terrified. My touched secret painfully curled back inside me. It didn't want to come out. What boy? There is no boy there, just me. He laughed. Just say it, he laughed. What's his name? I whispered. Do you mean Franz Cromer? Satisfied, he nodded at me. Bravo. You're a tough guy. We'll be friends. Now I have to tell you something. This Cromer, or whatever his name is, is a bad guy. His face tells me he's a scoundrel. What do you think? Oh yes, I sighed. He's bad. He's a Satan. But he must not know anything. For God's sake, he mustn't know anything. Do you know him? Does he know you? Just be quiet. He's gone and he doesn't know me, yet. But I really like to get to know him. He goes to elementary school. Yes. In which class? Into the fifth. But don't tell him anything. Please don't tell him anything. Be calm. Nothing will happen to you. Allegedly. Don't you want to tell me a little more about this Cromer? I can't. Don't make me. He was silent for a while. It's a pity, he then said. We could have taken the experiment even further. But I don't want to bother you. But don't you, you know that your fear of him isn't right. A fear like that destroys us completely. You have to get rid of it. You've got to get rid of it if you're going to become a real guy, do you understand? Certainly you are quite right, but it doesn't work. You don't know. You saw that I know a lot more than you thought. Do you owe him money? Yes, that too, but that's not the main thing. I can't say it. I can't. So it doesn't help if I give you as much money as you owe him. I could give it to you. No, no, it's not that, and I beg you, tell no one about it, not a word. You make me unhappy. Count on me, Sinclair. You'll tell me your secrets later. Never, never, I shouted violently. As you wish. I'm just saying maybe you'll tell me more later. Only voluntarily, of course. You don't think I'm going to do it like Cromer himself, do you? Oh, no. But you don't know anything about it. Nothing at all. I'm just thinking about it, and I'll never do it like Cromer does, believe me. You don't owe me anything either. We were silent for a long time and I grew calmer, but Demian's knowledge became more and more of a mystery to me. I'm going home now, he said, pulling his loaded coat closer together in the rain. I just want to tell you one thing again, since we've come this far. You should get rid of this guy. If all else fails, then beat him dead. I would be impressed and pleased if you did. I would help you too. I was afraid again. The story of Cain suddenly came back to me. I got scared and started to cry softly. There was too much uncanny around me. Very well, smiled Max Demian. Just go home. We'll do it. Although manslaughter would be the easiest. In things like this, the simplest is always the best. You are not in good hands with your friend Cromer. I came home and it seemed to me that I had been away for a year. Everything looked different. Between me and Cromer, there was something like the future, something like hope. I wasn't alone anymore. And only now did I see how terribly alone I had been with my secret for weeks and weeks. And I immediately remembered what I had thought through several times. That confession to my parents would relieve me, and yet not completely redeem me. 
Now I had almost confessed to someone else, to a stranger, and a presentiment of salvation flew toward me like a strong scent. However, my fear was far from over, and I was still prepared for long and dreadful arguments with my enemy. It was all the more strange to me that everything was going so quietly, so completely secretly and quietly. Cromer didn't whistle in front of our house for a day, two days, three days, a week. I didn't even dare to believe it, and inwardly I lay in wait for him. Suddenly, just like that when you never expected him, that he would be there again. But he was and stayed away. Distrustful of the new freedom, I still didn't really believe it. Until I finally met Franz Cromer, he came down from Sealer Goss straight towards me. When he saw me, he winced, made a savage grimace, and immediately turned back to avoid meeting me. That was an incredible moment for me. My enemy ran away from me. My Satan was afraid of me. The joy and surprise ran through me. Demian showed up again these days. He was waiting for me in front of the school. Hello, I said. Good morning, Sinclair. I just wanted to hear how you're doing. Cromer will leave you alone now, won't he? Did you do this? But how? How come? I don't get it. He didn't come at all. That's good. If he ever comes back, I don't think he will, but he's a cheeky fellow. Just tell him to think of Demian. But how does that relate? Did you start a quarrel with him and spank him? No, I don't really like doing that. I was just talking to him like I did to you, and I was able to make him understand that it was in his own best interest to leave you alone. Oh, surely you wouldn't have given him any money. No, my boy, you had already tried this way. He broke free no matter how hard I tried to question him, and I was left with the old uneasy feelings towards him, a strange mixture of gratitude and shyness, of admiration and fear, of affection and inner reluctance. I made a mental note to see him again soon, and then I wanted to talk to him more about all that, including the cane thing. It didn't come to that. Gratitude is not a virtue at all in which I believe, and to ask it of a child seems wrong to me. So I'm not very surprised at my own complete ingratitude which I showed towards Max Demian. Today I definitely believe that I am for life would have become sick and corrupt if he had not freed me from the clutches of Cromer. Even then I felt this liberation to be the greatest experience of my young life, but I ignored the liberator himself as soon as he had performed the miracle. The ingratitude, as I said, is not strange to me. The only strange thing to me is the lack of curiosity I showed. How was it possible that I could go on peacefully for a single day without getting closer to the mysteries Demian had introduced me to? How could I hold back the desire to hear more about Cain, more about Cromer, more about mind-reading? It is hardly understandable, and yet it is so. I suddenly saw myself unraveled from demonic nets, saw the world lying bright and joyful before me again, no longer succumbed to anxiety attacks and choking heart palpitations. The spell was broken. I was no longer a tormented damned. I was a schoolboy again, as always. My nature was trying to regain balance and calm as quickly as possible, and so above it all made an effort to push away the many things that were ugly and threatening, to forget them. Wonderfully quickly, the whole long story of my guilt and fear slipped from my memory without seeming to have left any scars or impressions. On the other hand, I also understand today that I tried to forget my help and savior just as quickly. From the veil of tears of my damnation from the terrible slavery at Cromer, I fled with all the instincts and strength of my damaged soul back to where I had been happy and content before, to the lost paradise that opened again, to the bright father and father-mother world, to the sisters, to the fragrance of purity and the godliness of Abel. The very day after my brief conversation with Demian, when I was finally completely convinced of my regained freedom and no longer feared a relapse, I did what I had so often and ardently wished for. I confessed. I went to my mother, I showed her the piggy bank, the lock which was broken and that was filled with chips instead of money, and I told her how long I had tied myself to an evil tormentor through my own fault. She didn't understand everything, but she saw the piggy bank. She saw my changed look, heard my changed voice, felt that I had recovered, and that I had been restored to her. And now, with high feelings, I celebrated the celebration of my readmission, the homecoming of the prodigal son. My mother took me to my father. The story was repeated, questions and exclamations of astonishment crowded in. Both parents stroked my head and breathed a sigh of relief from the long depression. Everything was wonderful. Everything was like in the stories. Everything dissolved in wonderful harmony.
Into this harmony I now fled with true passion. I couldn't get enough of having my peace and my parents' trust back. I became a model boy at home, playing more than ever with my sisters and singing the dear old songs of the services with blissful feelings of the redeemed and converted. It was from the heart. There was no lie in it. However, it wasn't right at all. And here's the point which alone truly explains my forgetfulness at Demian. I should have confessed to him. The confession would have been less decorative and touching, but more fruitful for me. Now I clung with all roots into my former paradisical world, had returned home and been accepted into grace. But Demian by no means belonged to this world, didn't fit into it. He too was different from Cromer, but still he too was a seducer. He too connected me to the second, the bad, bad world, and I wanted nothing more to do with it forever. I couldn't and didn't want to abandon Abel and help to glorify Cain, now that I had just become an Abel again myself. That's the external context, but the inner one was this. I was redeemed from Cromer's and the devil's hands, but not through my own strength and achievement. I had tried to walk the paths of the world, and they had been too slippery for me. Now that the grasp of a friendly hand had rescued me, I ran back to my mother's lap and the security of a cherished, pious, mild childishness, without looking aside. I made myself younger and more dependent, more childish than I was. I had to replace my dependency on Cromer with a new one, because I couldn't walk alone. So, in my blind heart, I chose dependency of father and mother, of the old, beloved, bright world, which I already knew was not the only one. So, in my blind heart, I chose dependency of father and mother, of the old, beloved, bright world, which I already knew was not the only one. If I hadn't done that, I should have stayed with Demian and confided in him. The fact that I didn't do that seemed to me at the time to be justifiable distrust of his strange thoughts. In truth, it was nothing but fear, because Demian would have asked more of me than my parents asked, much more, and he would have tried to make me more independent with drive and admonition, with mockery and irony. Oh, I know that today. Nothing in the world is more repugnant to people than to go the way that leads them to themselves. Still, about six months later, I couldn't resist the temptation, and on a walk I asked my father what was to be thought of the fact that some people declared Cain to be better than Abel. He was very surprised, and explained to me that this was a conception which lacked novelty. It even appeared in early Christian times and was taught in sects, one of which called itself the Cainites. But of course this great teaching is nothing more than an attempt by the devil to destroy our faith, for if one believes in the right of Cain and the wrong of Abel, then the result is that God made a mistake, that is, that the God of the Bible is not the right and only one, but a wrong one. In fact, the Cainites would have taught and preached similar things, but this heresy has long since disappeared from humanity, and he is only surprised that a schoolmate of mine could have learned something about it. Nevertheless, he warns me earnestly to refrain from these thoughts.